Take your Bible, if you would. Let's start off. Let's go to uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, if you would, please. The book of Genesis. And um, last night, uh, I didn't even know this had happened. I had a, a pastor friend of mine get in touch with me, and he said, what do you think about the war in Israel? And I went, what in the world is he talking about? And I got online and saw that uh, Hamas terrorist organization had attacked uh, Israel in the what's called the Gaza Strip. Now, I showed this during Sunday school and uh, I don't have time this morning, but I want you to I want you to write this down and study this out when you get home today or where wherever you go and study the word Gaza. That's in your Bible. And Ashkelon, A-S-H-K-E-L-O-N. That is one of the cities of the Philistines. Philistines sounds like Palestines. There's a reason, okay? Um, and in case you're wondering, um, Paul said it this way. All these things are written for examples to us. That means that we can see the future by looking at history in the Bible. Uh, Solomon said it like this in Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And he, he used the illustration of the water cycle. This was back before anybody knew that water evaporated from the oceans and was lifted up to the air. But he said, all the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. From the place where they started, thither they return. And he's telling us that the water goes down into the ocean, but the oceans don't fill up and take over the land. The ocean water evaporates through sunlight, and the, and the heat from the sun and the wind pick that moisture up from, in our case, the Gulf of Mexico, lifts it up above into the clouds, it comes together and forms clouds, and then whenever those clouds meet with a low pressure, this is what happened this week, the reason why we got all this rain, and the reason why you felt achy for the last three days, is because the low pressure was coming down from Canada. Well, that squeezes all that moisture out of the air, that moisture lands upon everywhere from Denver, Colorado, all the way over to Nashville, Tennessee, just about, and all the land in between, all those rivers run right into the Missouri River, the Ohio River, and then to the Mississippi River. And where does the Mississippi River go? Right back down to the Gulf of Mexico and dumps it all. It takes about 90 days, they said, for water to travel down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico and to complete that cycle. And um, God, God was showing us that. He said, see how they how that went? It went in a circle. And he said, that's how life is. How many of y'all know that? Say Amen. We go in cycles. We repeat the same things over and over again. It's kind of like my messages. Amen. Bless God, he woke up. Every now and then, Royal just wake up and just say, Amen. Just to, he don't know what I'm saying. He just says, Amen. Reminds me of them two old guys on the Muppets. You remember those guys? All right. But um, when you look at those places in the Bible, Ashkelon and Gaza, remember, God speaketh once, yea, twice. They may have had a partial fulfillment. They will have a perfect fulfillment in the last days. Now, I'm not saying that we're days away or weeks away or minutes away from the translation, the, the rapture. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying to you is, is that there are parts of the Bible that you just don't tell God no on. In fact, the whole Bible, but especially when it comes to Israel. Israel is a peculiar people. And if you were to, if you were to look at, uh, in an, from the, the viewpoint of an anthropologist, an anthropologist studies mankind, studies the human species, Practically all Arab people are sort of dark-skinned, black hair. 
the Jewish people stand out as being um, genetically different from their cousins, the Arabs. Because in the Jewish people, you'll find red-headed, freckle-faced people. You'll find some blonde-haired people. You'll find people that, that just all different mixtures, some darker skinned than others. But you don't, you don't see those kind of people in the Arab nations that surround Israel. They are genetically a peculiar people. But as far as God's promises, they are a different and a peculiar people unto God. God called them unto himself. He has taken a people of this world to himself to be called the people of God. God. Now, I knew that when I posted, I put a post on Facebook last night that I knew would irritate some people. So I did it anyway. Meaning, Robert, I did it on purpose. I did take down one comment. And it's from somebody that I know has followed this ministry for years. And, and uh, I've met him and I know what God's brought him out of. But he took an adverse position than me, and he was spreading some uh, information from a website that I just cannot go along with, and so I took it down. But the other people's comments I left up, and um, I noticed that as far as what I saw last night, no one as yet had quoted any scripture to put forth their idea that Israel today as a nation... Uh, is some sort of cursed people, that God hates them, that God is doing damage to them, that God is harming them in some way, and that God will eventually annihilate them. I, I didn't see anybody with any scripture on there, so I just decided to stir it up. I put scriptures on mine. And I put places on there that are, to me, are irrefutable to declare that the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are the declared people of God. God made promises to Abram. Notice I said Abram. Meaning that God made these promises before he was Abraham. Before Abraham did what God wanted him to do, and that is take his only son to, and offer him up there for a burnt offering. Even as... Abraham's doing that. God says, I'm going to change your name now. And, and your name's going to be uh, is from Abram to Abraham. And uh, it's because a Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Well, even before Abraham believes God, God has already made a covenant of promise with him. And we're going to look at that. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 12. I had that. On the screen, somewhere, there it is. Whew. Just making sure I had the right note. Genesis 12, then we'll go back to these other passages here momentarily. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said unto Abram, not Abraham, he was, he was the same guy. It's just that Abram was his old name. It represented the old man. Abraham is his new name. It represents the new man. God, the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country. Now I want you to follow this in a sort of a typological sense. The country that you're in now is not the country that you're going to spend eternity in. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's going to be a different country. It's going to be a different land. And so Abram is us. God calls upon us to get out of our country, from our kindred, from our kind, from our people. Out of our father's house. My father's house originally was in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And then it was in um, uh, um, Arnold, Missouri. Then it was in Festus, Missouri. And now my father's house is New Jerusalem above. Amen. But I'm, I'm to leave this father's house and I'm going to go to a land one of these days that God's going to show me. And he's shown it to us in the pages of the Bible. And he says in verse 2, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. In fact, right now there is a, uh, 
a place there, and you pray for me. I'm about to lose the nose piece out of my glasses. And that, that's going to irritate me. But anyway, there is a place in, in Israel right now called the Abrahamic Center. And it features um, a, I guess, a memorial or whatever, or a honoring place to three of the world's largest religions that are all based upon Abraham, Judaism, <clears throat> Christianity, and Islam. Now, as far as I care, Islam can go chase. Amen. They can leave it and just leave it with us and the Jews. Amen. Because they don't, they don't really follow Abraham. They don't care about Abraham. They think the promise that God made was through Ishmael. That's crazy. The promise is made through Isaac, and that's the lineage that Christ came from. But anyway, God said, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Verse 3, and here's what you need to understand. I will bless them that bless thee. Amen. I will bless any person, any nation, any king, any president, any church. I will bless that church of any church that will pray a blessing upon the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, any Jews you might know, or just the whole lot of them. God said, I will bless that person. And I'm telling you, I believe God will even bless lost people who bless Israel, who stand for Israel. There are undoubtedly people who are elected officials, congressmen, judges, who, so on, that stand for Israel. And they don't need a reason. They don't need, a, they don't need evidence. They, don't need, they just stand for Israel. They know that Israel has been a good ally of the United States of America. That we need them, especially in the Middle East. We need an ally there. And so strategically, it makes sense for us to have Israel as our friend there. But there are lost congressmen who understand the value that Israel has in this country right here and so they will not go along with any attack on israel they'll not bless iran they'll not bless hamas they'll not bless any of the terrorist organizations that are are wanting to to actually kill every jew that they're listen this has been done before we're not even a hundred years away from what adolf hitler tried all throughout Europe into Russia, he wanted every Jew on the earth destroyed. He wasn't just content with the German Jews. He wanted all of them killed. Now, what spirit do you think was behind him doing that? That was Satan doing that. Satan who was behind that. And we're not even a hundred years away from that. And we're dealing with people now who want the annihilation of of the people of Israel. Yasser Arafat said that we will continue to do what we do until the last Jew is found floating in the Mediterranean Sea. That's resolve. That's hatred of a kind that you and I probably don't even know anything about. That God said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now in the phrase, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed, is a direct re reference to Jesus Christ. Because Christ was in Abraham at this time. He was in his loins. And Christ was going to proceed from the loins of Abraham. And God said, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed when they know Jesus Christ. Amen. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. Where is Adolf Hitler at, by the way? Yeah. And Yasser is still looking for his 70 virgins. That he was promised by Allah. And God said, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And God cursed Germany. For doing what they did to the Jews. And God will curse any nation, any state, any people, any church, any religion that turns its back upon the people of Israel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I, I just, I, this, this morning is going to be more like a, I guess maybe a history prophecy lesson than it is anything. 
But pray for me as I preach it, all right? Father in heaven, I pray to your God that you would bless and anoint this message. Lord, I, I believe you laid it on my heart, Lord, when I found out what was going on. And Father, I love Israel. I remember the day, Lord, that you showed me and made me aware of something in Scripture, Lord, that just made me just break out in tears. And Father, I thank you for that. A love for your people. Even though those people right now, they despise you, they despise their Savior, they despise the Gentiles' gospel, even though it was to go to the Jew first. They despise Christianity and the church. And Lord, they are full of sin. And yet, Father, you've known them from the beginning. You have tolerated them on more than one occasion. You're more aware of their sinfulness than anybody on this earth is even qualified to know. You know them, Lord. And so some people might ask, why, why should we pray for them? Why, why would God bless them? And Lord, it just, it's simple enough to say it's because you love them. And when you love somebody, you just love them. And there's no denying it. You love Israel the way Hosea ended up loving Gomer. Who, even though she harlotted herself, she left Hosea's house, went and became a slave stripped down and sold in the markets. Yet Hosea loved her and wanted to take her again to be his wife. And he paid the price so that she could be redeemed. What a savior. And so Father, help us to understand that the story of Israel and the promises to Israel, Lord, are always bound tight to the promises that you've made to us and that if you break your promise to israel then there's nothing that would hold you from or keep you from breaking your promise to us gentiles help us to see god that our salvation will be part of their salvation and time will tell that the scriptures already predict it but Father, help us, dear God, as a church and as a people to always bless the people of Israel and to bless that nation. Father, give us light and understanding from the word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, let me go back up here to Hosea chapter 6. If you want to turn there, you can. I would underline these verses, mark it down. Hey, if for no other reason, now you're getting a chance to turn to the book of Hosea, which... Sometimes people can spend most of a lifetime and never read the book of Hosea or even know where it is. Hosea chapter 6. I have a, I have a Bible that, uh, interestingly enough, it was an NIV. And uh, in this NIV Bible, under Hosea chapter 6, it had a comment that said that this was a a, uh, an arrogant, prideful brag or boast on Israel's part that God would bless them and send them revival when they didn't deserve it. And I want to ask you a question. The times that God gave you great revival, when, tell me when you deserved it. What acts did you perform in order to get God or force God to bless you? There is nothing that we can do. There is nothing in our hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling is what the song says. We do nothing to deserve God's blessing and God's revival. God's resurrection of us. God, listen, God raised you from the dead when he saved you. And tell me what you did to deserve that. Nothing. In fact, you were down in sin. You were as dead as Lazarus was. And God awakened you and caused you to rise up again. And you walk now in his sight. For no other reason other than God poured out his mercy and his love upon you. Somebody say amen. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. This is a prophecy. For he hath torn and he will heal us. 
he hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will, will he revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up. Now, let me ask, let me stop right here and ask you the question. What does this sound like to you? That after two days, on the third day, somebody's going to rise from the dead. Amen. Jesus did it. He becomes the, the uh, what does the Bible say about him? What's the uh, Bible term? The uh, first fruits of the dead or... Uh, uh, I can't remember the phrase, but anyway, he's the one that tasted death for every man. He's the one that rose from the dead first, and he's showing the rest of it. This is how it's done, amen. This is how you rise from the dead. And so, a day with the Lord is as a, and a thousand years is as a, and so from the time that the Lord rose from the dead until now, that's been about two days, hasn't it? Think about it. So, on the third day, I believe God is going to raise up his people once again. Or I'll say it the way some of y'all say it. Once again. And he'll do it twice. Amen. Oh, after two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Verse 3. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. There's two types of rain in the northern hemisphere for harvesting crops. The first one is the spring rains. You want that after you plant your seed, you got your ground tilled up, you got your seed planted, and you want the spring rains to, to lock that seed in, to give it moisture, so it'll burst fruit through the ground. You want it to grow all summer long. And then you want those harvest rains to give it that one last shot, that boost of, of uh, hydrodynamic energy to give it that last push it needs in order for the harvest time to come, for the, uh, the transformation to take place so they can go out and harvest. That's what this latter and former rain is. And I want you to think of that as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, that would be a former rain. When He's poured out again to the people of Israel, that will be a latter rain. And God's going to send both of them. Somebody say amen. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. And I do want you to turn there. If I was just kidding about turning to Hosea, I'm not kidding about Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel 37. This is something you need to know. This is something you need to know. If you know this, happy are you. And I want you to be happy when you leave here today. If for nothing else, be happy that I didn't name your sin this morning, make you feel guilty. But I guess you'd be happy about that too, the sin be forgiven. Ezekiel 37, if you don't know what this is, make a little note in your Bible. This is dim, dry bones. You know the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, ankle bone connected to the shin bone, shin bone connected to the knee bone, the thigh bone, the hip bone, the back bone, the shoulder bone, the neck bone, the head bone. Amen. And I want you to notice what God tells Ezekiel to do. And let me ask you this question as we get into this. By what method... Does God choose to save people? He has a method in the Bible. By the foolishness of preaching. It's not through building programs. It's not through having mega church campuses. It has nothing to do with how good your music is has nothing to do with the light show that you put on the stage and the energy that you bring the crowd into during the praise and worship service. doesn't have anything to do with that stupid coffee shop that you got out front. doesn't have anything to do with that. The fact that as a preacher you wear a pair of old scruffy jeans or your shirt tail hanging out and your hair all standing up because you want to look cool and you're 68 years old. Be like, be like Ron coming in here. Some Sunday morning with his shirt tail hanging out, holes all in his britches. And he made that little sprig of hair stand up with hair gel. After him dying at jet black. 
And everybody's going, ah, we're not buying it. God chose the foolishness of preaching. Verse 3, he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Now those bones, we already know the end of this story. Those bones are the whole house of Israel. And this prophecy right here is given. Ezekiel was an exile prophet. Israel, as far as Judah has already been taken into Babylon. Assyria has already, or the ten northern tribes have already been taken into Assyria. So Ezekiel's not prophesying of a revival in his day. Nor is he speaking of anything that happened at Christ's first coming because there was no revival among Israel during that time. In fact, the entire book of Acts is seen as the Jewish leaders hatred of the gospel of Jesus Christ and them trying to stamp it out. So he said, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy. What does prophesy mean? Preach. Preach to these bones. Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them. That's what prophesy means. It means and say unto them. O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Not maybe, not might, not if, if, it, if it works out okay. And he said, verse 6, And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall what? Know that I am the Lord. You see, Israel, the Jew, believes in God right now, but they have a serious identification problem of who that God is and what he's like and what his name is and, and who his son is. They have a serious problem with that. They do not know, even though they claim they know. They don't know. And they have, I'm telling you, I've studied world religions just as a as a. A study of part of what I do. And I can tell you that Kabbalah Judaism is the most difficult religious concept in the universe to try to conceive of. Madonna spent her whole life trying to study Kabbalah. And you know what? She don't get it. She don't understand it. There are people who live 80 and 90 years old and have studied Kabbalah all their life and they don't understand it. Now that is in direct opposition to what Paul told us. That somebody would come and preach against the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. When I was nine years old, I understood that Jesus died for my sins and I asked Jesus to save me. And he did. Nine years old. Hunter came to me the other day. And said, Papa, guess what? I said, what? He said, um, I asked Jesus to save me. And he said, all by myself, too. <laughs> Nobody was awake. Only God can do something like that. And if it's simple enough for a child like that to understand, then what is it you don't get? Amen? It's easy, it's easy economics. God will give you the riches of heaven for absolutely nothing. Isn't that something? Now, in verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. And the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Now, so far, this is happening exactly the way God said. I'm going to put sinews on the bones, which is muscle and, and ligament and tendons. And he said, then I'm going to cover it with skin. And that's happened. But there's no breath. So I want you to picture now 1947. What happened as far as 1947 with Israel? What happened? It was the year 
that the United Nations said, we're going to give them this allotment of land, and they will call it the land of Israel, and the United Nations officially recognized the establishment of the state of Israel. Because after World War II, the Jews said, never again. We're not going to live in somebody else's country while belonging to our own in hopes that they won't persecute us or kill us again. We want our own land, and they got their own land. Do you think God could have stopped them if he wanted to? If God wasn't in it, do you think God would have stopped it? If God wasn't in it, he would have stopped it. He would have said, you know, you don't deserve a land. You still hate me. You don't know who Jesus is, so I'm not giving you nothing. That wasn't the plan of God. The plan of God was to cause sinews to come upon their flesh and skin to cover it. But they're in the land now, but they're still dead. Why? They have no breath in them. And so notice that he says uh, uh, in verse 9, Then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. The disciples heard a rushing mighty and he said, prophesy unto the wind and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the, the Matthew wind, the Mark wind, the Luke wind, the John wind. Come from the four winds and breathe and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Isn't that how God did it with you? Did you believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Christ would, uh, came to this earth, came and, and died for your sins and rose again so that you can be saved? Isn't that the gospel that you heard? It's the same gospel they're going to hear. When they hear that gospel, and when that wind blows, those four winds blow, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. That right there is God fulfilling everything that he ever said or promised to the people of Israel. He said, I'm going to cause you to come back to life again. Do you remember the story of the, of the uh, Shunammite woman who had a little boy? And she was barren. She had no children. And then she blessed the man of God, Elisha. And Elisha said, what does that woman need? And his servant said, she never had a son. So he said, tell her she's going to have a son. She didn't want to believe it. So lo and behold, she has a son. But then not too long later, the son had, we think, maybe had a heat stroke or something. But he died right there in his mama's arms. And the mama brought him to the man of God. And the man of God rose him from the dead again. And he lived. That's Israel. That's Israel. Israel is Naomi, whose husband died, and her two sons died, and there's no one to inherit the husband's land. And it just goes off it without an inheritance. And here comes Boaz. He's the kinsman. Means I'm related to you. I'm a Jew just like you are. And he took uh, Ruth, who was uh, her daughter-in-law. Her son had died. Took Ruth to be his wife. Purchase them because Christ didn't just snatch us from the devil. He paid him off. He paid the ransom for you and I. And, and God, uh, 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 Boaz married Ruth and she had a baby. And what did she do? Lo and behold, she turned around and gave it to Naomi and said, that's your son. What do you think is going to happen? God, I believe, is going to use the Gentile church to bring Israel to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Man, I get, I get happy about this stuff. That's Israel. Israel are the 11 brothers of Joseph. Who when Joseph announces to them when he's 17 that he had a dream and it looked like that his brothers and his mom and dad's going to be bowing down to him and that made his brethren angry. They said, how dare you? You're the youngest son. How dare you? We know daddy loves you more than he loves the rest of us. How dare you come out here and tell us that you think you had a dream and, and where we're going to bow down to you. That'll be a cold day. So they took their own brother, bound him up, threw him down in a pit, would have killed him. But then Jews do what Jews do. Money came along. Amen. They got a better deal. Oh, you got money? We'll take that. Never underestimate a Jew willing to make the first sale of the day. Amen. 
Um, but anyway, they sold Joseph. He goes off. Now he, you know what he is? He's ruling over the Gentiles. In Egypt, he becomes Lord and master of all. And uh, years later, they come to Joseph. They don't know who Joseph is. Joseph knows who they are, amen. Listen, I promise you, all this stuff, you're going to hear stuff on the internet. Wow. Well, only the white people are the real Jews. Or only people from Northern Europe, they're the real Jews. Or the only Mormons, they're the real Jews. Or the Jehovah's Witness, they're the real Jews. Or the Catholics, they're the real Jews. I'm telling you, if there's a mix-up on who the Jews are, I guarantee you God knows who they are. He's not going to miss out. God's not going to end up and say, whoops, I gave the blessing to the wrong people. Oh, that's terrible. He's going to bless the right people. Joseph knew who his brothers were. And when he decided to reveal himself, he said, I, Joseph, be not afraid. The Bible says he went to every one of his brothers and he hugged them and he wept upon their shoulders and cried over them. And said, oh, I'm glad to, I'm glad to save you. I'm glad to save you. And when they were afraid that Joseph was just setting them up to kill him because what they did for him, Joseph said, no, 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 no. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good, to save you. That's Israel. And what you're seeing right now is a Israel that is set for redemption. But they don't have the redemption in hand yet. They don't have the wind blowing yet. And I'm not going to get into all of what I believe this morning. I might save that for this afternoon. But I believe some things are going to happen that precipitate this. Let's turn, we already turned to Genesis 12. Let's look at the story of, let's turn to Galatians chapter 4. Uh, this is this is a um, this is a message where if we, I'm not sure that we're going to sing three verses of just as I am at the end of it, but I just want you to know that when God makes a promise, He keeps it. He doesn't break His promises. If God broke His promise to Israel, He'll break it to you. But I don't believe God will do that. In fact, I know God won't do it. God's not capable. God's not a man that he should lie, the Bible says. And we see that in, we see it all in typology. Um, the two daughters of Laban, Rachel and Leah. Leah is the ugly sister. She's the Gentiles who must be married first before Rachel. Even though Rachel was the first love, Leah's the first betrothed. And so she must be married first before Rachel can have her wedding. But once that time is fulfilled, then Rachel's going to come into the marriage. That's typology for you. That's how it works. Uh, they are Jacob and Israel is Jacob and Esau. Israel is Esau. Esau sold away his birthright. He was the firstborn. He should have received the birthright from his father. But he sold it away for a bowl of pottage and gave up his birthright. And so Jacob went in and stole his blessing and his birthright away from him. Jacob is the Gentiles who, even though we were born last, we come first. What did Jesus say? He who is last shall be first and he who is first shall be last in the kingdom of heaven. And so Israel is Esau. Who, and we're going to see that in a minute. Right now we're looking at Isaac and Ishmael. Who was born first, Ishmael or Isaac? Ishmael was born first. He was born of Hagar. What's Hagar's problem? She's a slave. She's bondage. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. God is here describing the two peoples that he saves. The Jews and the Gentiles. And he said, one was born by a bondmaid, one was born by a free woman. Verse 23, but he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory or a typology or a symbol or a metaphor. You can use those terms there or an example. For these are the two covenants. We have two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, where God says, do the commandments and live. Break the commandments you die. The new covenant is you can't do the commandments. Believe Jesus. Believe his word. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Two commandments instead of ten. And so the second covenant is believe. So while we have one 
whose covenant is perform and do, we have another one, which is what the Gentiles believe now. It is that we believe and are saved. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. So Hagar represents, and her children represent everybody born under Mount Sinai. They're born in bondage. If you think that by righteous deeds and keeping, quote unquote, the commandments, if you think that you will attain God's blessings and heaven through that, good luck. See, I won't even, worship, I won't even wish you Godspeed on that one. Just good luck. Because more than likely, in fact, I know for a fact, you will never make it. Never make it. No Jew has ever reached heaven simply on the merits of the righteousness alone except the one Jew that matters, Jesus Christ. The rest of us believe. Which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Verse 25, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. It's not Mary. Mary is not our mother. Amen. Jerusalem is the city of God, who, which is free, whose gates are of pearl and streets are as gold. That is our mother. It's in heaven. We were birthed in heaven. Somebody say amen. So it is written now, verse 27, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. The Jews hate us. They hate us. And truth be known, they've probably done more to, to destroy Bible Christianity than any other one group in the world. If the truth be known. I can tell you that they were the ones responsible for trying to destroy the gospel all throughout the book of Acts. You find their hand in all of it. They hate the gospel that bad. But God's going to turn it around one of these days. And just like Paul, Paul hated the gospel, didn't he? Was Paul an anti-Christian? Was he anti-Jesus? Was he anti-gospel? Not, not when he got to Damascus, he wasn't. He gets to Damascus, now he is 100% gospel, 100% Jesus, 100% I'm going to preach this. Paul is your example right there. Of what God is going to do with Israel. Israel doesn't know who their Messiah is, well it's Jesus. So we find Hagar. If we look at the story of Hagar, back in Genesis chapter 21, you don't have to turn there, but you might as well. And God heard the voice. And remember, uh, Abraham, upon um, instruction from Sarah, said, you need to get that woman out of here. She is persecuting our son, Isaac. They're making fun of him. And Sarah was really put out, which is why... A man should not try to dwell with two women. Thank you for that amen. Nothing against women, but God said a man and a woman. And if you look at every house in the Bible where there's multiple wives, it's a mess. So he takes Hagar out with a bottle of water and a loaf of bread and says, goodbye, good luck. Adios, Nechayim, sends them out, and the water is spent, the bread is gone, Hagar takes young Ishmael, sets him over far enough away where she can't hear him scream as he's dying of thirst. But she cried out to God, and God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and behold, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. You see, now Hagar, if Hagar is a representative of Israel, here's what you see here. You see God using that illustration, that story, to show you what's going to happen with Israel. So Hagar is Ishmael, or the Jews right now, in bondage. 
when Ishmael cried to the Lord, when Hagar cried to the Lord, did God hear them cry? Did God save them? How did God save them? I have it underlined on the screen. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. By the way, do you know how many sons Ishmael had? Twelve. How many sons did Isaac or Jacob have? Twelve. The promise is there, man. Jacob and Esau, the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. We know who they were. They were Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a man that, um, that God favored. God had already said, I love Jacob, and I hate Esau. He's already said it. He said that before they were ever born. You know what God was showing you? Let me read this. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. The elder is Israel compared to us. Israel came along a long time before we did. We just came along a couple thousand years ago. So the elder is serving us right now. We're, they are under the dominion of the law. But when one of these days, when God takes us away, he's going to be a blessing once again to the elder son, to Esau. Romans 9, 10 says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And what you have in there is the type between the difference between the inner man, which is conceived of God, and the outer man, which is conceived by man. God hates the one, the outer man, but he loves the inner man, which is Christ in us. Does everybody understand that? That's how you see these types. Esau represents those who are trying to live and be saved by their own righteous deeds. When Esau, if you remember, when he goes crawling back to their father, Isaac, asking for a blessing. Isaac says, it doesn't matter how much you cry, it doesn't matter what you do. It's already been done. Israel is going to have to learn that no matter how much of the law they think they're keeping and how righteous they are according to the law, the law keeping in law is not going to get them into heaven. Only Christ and his mercy and his grace and their belief will get them into heaven. One of these days it will happen. Then we have the same blessing that turn to Genesis 27. Turn to Genesis 27. I want you to see the double witness here. Mark this down in your Bibles. The same blessing that God gave to Abraham, God gave to Jacob. Notice what it says. Genesis 27, 28. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord. Now let me tell you when this is going to happen. One of these days, Christ is going to descend from heaven. He's going to take us home to be with him. We're going to return with him in Revelation 19. And we're going to rule over the nations for a thousand years. The, the nations of the earth are going to bow down to us for a thousand years. So he said, let them be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Same blessing that God gave to Abraham is the blessing that God gave to Jacob. You do not, if you're a member of Congress, I don't know if anybody in Congress is going to listen to this old preacher preach his message. But if you're a member of Congress and your particular party is telling you to straddle the fence on this war right now, you say to them, I'm going to go with what God said and I'm going to bless Israel. I say we appropriate all the funds necessary for Israel to win this battle. 
Amen. And then right after that, let's send all... If, listen, if you politicians don't like us preachers in America, get up a bill, get the money, send us to Israel. We'll go preach over there. Amen. They need to hear the gospel. Somebody say amen. Do not curse the people of Israel. Even Esau's... Now, Esau's blessing, watch this, was almost identical to Jacob's blessing. What this shows is... If we're Jacob, if the Gentiles are Jacob, then Esau receives almost an identical blessing. And Isaac, his father, answered him and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew from heaven above. That is identical to what, God, or to what uh, Isaac said to Jacob. Same blessing. However, in verse 40, By thy sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have the dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Right now, the Gentile believers have the dominion. One of these days, that will be taken away, and Israel will have the dominion. Israel will have the dominion. In the latter days, it will happen. Now, Hebrews 11. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Remember, he did the same thing with Jacob and Esau and with Rachel and Leah that he did with Manasseh and Ephraim. He had Manasseh on one side, Ephraim on the other, and he switched his hands over. He gave the right hand blessing to the second born, and he gave the left hand blessing to the first born. And, and uh, Joseph was going to try to correct him. And he said, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. Let me do it. And what that's telling you is, is that when God is done with the Gentiles here on this earth, God will then turn his attention to, and, and bless Israel with salvation. They're going to know who their Savior is. Now, uh, Exodus chapter 3. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. In Matthew 22, Jesus quoted that verse by saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Those bones are going to live one of these days. Amen. And he's the God. Now, he's not the God of Abraham, Ishmael, and Yasser Arafat. He's not the God of the Ayatollah Khomeini, is he? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living. By the way, I found that phrase 12 times in the scriptures. 12 is the number for God's promise fulfilled. It's in Genesis 12 that God first made the promise to Abram. And this passage is mentioned 12 times in the scriptures. Now, turn to Romans 10, and I'm going to quit here. Wipe your forehead, say, Phew. Amen. Romans 10. Look at what Paul said. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what? Do you believe God is going to say no to Paul's prayer? Not going to happen. That they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Paul prays for his people to be saved. God's going to answer that prayer. It'll come 2,000 years later, but it'll come. So now in Romans 11. This is about the olive branch. I say then, hath God cast away his people? What's the answer to that question? No. God has not cast away his people. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. God knows the end of the people of Israel, that they will be saved, they will believe, they will turn their hearts. God will take their hearts, write his law upon their inward parts. They will be God's people. God will be their God. He will give them a new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, 31, he said, I will give you a new covenant, not like the covenant of Mount Sinai, but here's the covenant. Number one, I'm going to forgive all your sins. And you won't have done anything to deserve it. 
Number two, I'm going to write my law on your inward parts. Number three, you're not going to say any more the Ark of the Covenant because you won't need it anymore. And nobody will need to be your teacher because you're going to know these things. God promised in Jeremiah 31 that God would send them a new covenant. God has sent us that covenant now. But the true recipients of that covenant are lying in wait, and that is Israel. For he said in verse 3, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down thine altars and I am left alone and they seek my life. And what saith the answer of God unto them? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Somebody wrote on my Facebook post last night. Oh, Israel. Oh, they're evil. Oh, they got Zionist conspiracies everywhere. Oh, they fly the uh, LGBTQ plus flag uh, there, uh, there in Tel Aviv. Oh, they got sodomites everywhere. Oh, they're bad. Yeah, so... You mean we're not? You mean we're good? We deserve to be saved? We deserve to have God's blessing? No! A thousand times no! And if we don't deserve it, they really don't deserve it. But they're going to get it. And why? So that God can show forth and manifest His power to save even the worst people in the world. Yes, they're behind all the conspiracies. Yes, they are international bankers. Yes, they are. If you, if you find uh, organizations that are turning the world toward a one world empire, I guarantee you there's going to be Jews sitting on the board. But I'm here to tell you, God has not turned his back on the people that he foreknew. You know what that word right there tells you? If God foreknew they were going to be saved, they have to be saved. Or else God is a liar. And God is not a liar. Let's bow our heads right where we are. You study Romans 11. I may pick up on this this afternoon. Because I left out a lot, believe it or not. But I'm telling you, the promises that God made to you personally as a born-again Christian, those promises were first made to the Jew, every one of them. So what makes anybody think that we're any better than the Jews? That our forefathers wouldn't have killed the prophets? If it had been our forefathers, we would have followed God? What makes us think that we're any better than they are? We're not. All we like sheep have gone astray. For there is none righteous. No, not one. And so whether it's a Jew or whether it's a Gentile, none of us deserve the grace of God. And yet God loved this people. In Ezekiel 16, he describes the love that he has for earthly Jerusalem. Even though she went out and harlot herself to every king that came by. Yet God loves them. Israel is Gomer. The wife of Hosea. Who after he marries her and falls in love with her. She goes out and plays the harlot again. And when Hosea finds that she's gone, he sends her children out to find her. And lo and behold, she's in the slave market. And instead of Hosea turning his back on his true love, he pays the price, takes her down, clothes her, washes her clean, only this time, she knows she's loved. Those of you who are listening to me right now, no matter who you are, and no matter what you've done, God loves you. God loves you the way that he loves the Jews. They don't deserve his love. 
We don't deserve God's love. We don't deserve God's blessing. We don't deserve to have our enemies destroyed. And I'm praying that God would cause the enemies in this war to be destroyed. Permanently. They don't, have, they don't deserve to have their enemies destroyed. They don't deserve to live. But God loves them enough to where he'll do it for them anyway. And if he'll do it for them, I promise you he'll do it for you. If you're listening to my voice and you don't think you deserve to be saved or you're too bad to be forgiven, I'm going to remind you of the Jew. They're doubly worse than any of us and yet God loves them.